Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. Question number one, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve out of hours provision at NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. The Scottish Government is working closely with health boards and integrated authorities to ensure a safe and effective GP led out of hours service is provided across Scotland. Over the last three years, we have invested £25 million to support the delivery of 25 recommendations in Sir Lewis Ritchie's report on GP-led out-of-hours and urgent care services. The recommendations are focused on ensuring <clears throat> a wider, more resilient multidisciplinary team is in place to support our out-of-hours GPs. In 2018-19, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde will receive £1.1 million to support local action. This is in addition to investment to train 1,000 additional paramedic, paramedics over the course of this parliament who will play a critical part in the expanding multidisciplinary teams. Jackie Bailey. Could I thank the Minister for his response and um, certainly welcome him to his new role um, in the health team. NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has just announced their vision for the future of acute services. Over 30 services set to change, including out-of-hours services at the Vale of Leven Hospital. There is no clear information on the impact on hospital services, nor is there clarity about the consultation process. Now, some people more cynical than me have suggested that Health Board don't want to consult. So can I ask the Minister if he would give me a guarantee that the information on hospital provision will be provided urgently and that significant service changes such as these will be subject to full consultation and let me issue an invitation through him for the new cabinet secretary to come and accompany me on a visit to the Vale of Leven Hospital. Minister. Thank, thank the member for her uh, supplementary and invitation which I, I see the cabinet secretary is um, designate is, is here. Um, the, the member will know my commitment and um, the, the cabinet secretary designates commitment to um, engagement on a whole range of issues. The, the, the fact is for the Vale of Leven, the Vale of Leven had many, many years of being run down, services being run down um, by, the, by the previous administration and it was this government which ended that uncertainty with our vision for the Vale. Annie Wills. Presiding officer. On Sunday last week, a shortage of GPs in Greater Glasgow meant there weren't enough doctors on duty to staff its out-of-hour centres between 1am and 6am. This meant patients requiring urgent medical care were asked to go to A&E, while some had to wait for primary care emergency centres to open again at 6am. Given the challenges of GP recruitment and retention in Scotland, how will the Minister refresh field recruitment drives known not to be working? Minister. There was clearly a specific problem which um, Ms Wells relates to. Um, that was identified in, in time that alternative strategies could be put in place. And I think that was the right thing to do because there would have been a danger of people being um, pointed towards um, services which would not have been suitable. So I think it was correct that, that the action was taken in, in advance of that becoming a problem. But clearly we need to look at um, what lessons can, can be learned there for the future. Question number two, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer, and I refer the Chamber to my register of interest as a board member of North Highland College to ask the Scottish Government what flexibility there is for rural colleges in the harmonisation of terms and conditions under national bargaining. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, this Government is committed to national bargaining for Scotland's colleges, and we are funding in full the costs of harmonisation of pay, terms and conditions. In 2018-19, this amounts to additional funding of £31.7 million. In addition, we have increased rural and remoteness funding by £1 million to £8 million this year. Gail Ross. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. North Highland College, in my constituency, takes students on block placement from local employers. Some weeks they do full-time hours, other weeks they do none. And the College is finding it a challenge to align their lectures weekly hours with the needs of the students. How is the Scottish Government working with rural colleges to ensure they can fulfil their obligations to all their students, lecturers and staff in line with national bargaining terms and conditions? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, I, I think the first thing I'd like to say is that we are very much welcome and value the approach that's taken by colleges such as North Highland College, indeed all colleges around the country, to essentially uh, in, uh, adapt the learning approaches to individual circumstances reflecting the geography 
uh, the conditions and the communities in which the colleges are active. So I would be keen to make sure that in our dialogue with North Highland College, um, the, the, the Funding Council has a very full and clear awareness of the models that have been used by North Highland College uh, to take forward its, um, its work. And uh, we are keen to make sure that that is able to be reflected within the uh, harmonised uh, terms and conditions that will be brought into place as a consequence of national bargaining. Uh, I suppose the, the most direct answer to Gail Ross's question is that the opportunity for dialogue and discussion around all of these questions is central to how we resolve <laughs> the uh, particular uh, needs and circumstances of North Highland College and I would encourage the College to engage in those questions to ensure these issues are properly and fully addressed as part of our efforts to deliver a modern and flexible workforce. Question number three, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to increase the funding for and provision of insulin pumps for under-18s. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. The latest published data shows Scottish NHS Board's performance for children under 18 years of old at 34.4% which considerably exceeds the ministerial commitment of 25% set in the Chief Executive letter issued in 2012. This commitment was met by the 1st of April 2015 and was supported by £7.5 million of Scottish Government funding. We expect NHS boards to provide insulin pumps to all clinically suitable children and young people once structured education and pump training is completed. We will continue to keep the support of this important area of work under review. David Stewart. I welcome the Minister to his new role in the health team. Does the Minister accept that pump therapy cuts hospital emissions, reduces long-term complications and improves quality of life? And does the Minister share my view that we need to do more to support young people with insulin pump therapy and continuous glucose monitoring by ending postcode lottery and boosting Scottish pump usage to levels experienced in Europe and the USA? Minister. I thank the, the member for his, um, his, his welcome. Um, I think the, me the member makes a, a, a lot of um, very good points. I recognise the member's particular interest in, in, in this field as uh, the con convener of the cross-party group on diabetes. Um, we expect NHS boards to provide this life-changing um, technology where it is clinically appropriate. Um, the additional funding provided by the Scottish Government um, is to support NHS boards' efforts to increase the level of provision of of um, insulin pumps and that funding has been allocated taking account of the needs to reduce the gap between the lowest and highest levels of provision. Uh, levels of local investment, um, comments made by local boards um, is in discussions about the, the, the pump services, obviously something we need to take account of. Um, but I, I, I agree that for, for many, many people, the, the pumps and the glucose monitoring equipment will, will make a real difference. And where that is clinically appropriate, then we need to, to look to how we can make sure that is, a, is available. Christine Graham. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Minister if he'll use his considerable influence to have NHS borders roll out freestyle Libra right across uh, the area? Because at the moment it's only on trial and those who are on the trials are very worried, it's very successful, are very worried that we were withdrawn from them. Minister. NHS boards are taking a phased approach and um, made the decision to prescribe freestyle Libra to 50 patients in the first instance. Um, to allow staff to deliver the appropriate education required within the resources to, to the team. So. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted that Ayrshire Nan Health Board it uses flash glucose monitoring technology, meaning people living with diabetes don't have to regularly do a finger prick, finger prick test. This technology is easier to use, less painful, and improves people's self-management, and it's also cost-effective for people with diabetes treated with insulin and testing frequently. What plans are there to ensure access across Scotland to this life-changing technology? Minister. I also recognise the members' um, interest in, in this, this field and it's a, a, an area that um, was raised earlier. Um, obviously, this was a, a, an area that Aileen Campbell um, responded to in the chamber, chamber last week, and I refer members to her extensive answer. Each NHS board uh, has to consider the inclusion of a drug or device into their local uh, formulary in the context of their local population and priorities and whilst managing their budgets and resources effectively. Due to the current limited good clinical trial data to support long-term clinical evidence, benefits and cost effective effectiveness for Freestyle Libra, some NHS boards have decided to wait for the advice statement from the Scottish Health Technology Group. 
um, due in July. And I look forward to the advice statement from SHTG, which I expect to be a valuable source of advice on which NHS boards will base their final decisions on how Freestyle Libra is prescribed in the longer term. Question for Kezia Dugdale. Do you ask the Scottish Government what the average number of care placement moves are for young people? Minister, sorry, Minister Marie Todd. For the 14,897 young people in care on 31st July 2017, the average number of care placements was 2.3. Just under half the young people in care on 31st July 2017 were in their first placement. I thank the Minister for that answer. Last week's attainment statistics told us that 48% of care experienced school leavers that had just one placement achieved a level 5 qualification or better, but the figure fell to just 19% if you'd been moved three times or more in your childhood. The evidence is clear, it doesn't need to wait for the independent care review to report. So what urgent action does the Minister intend to take to reduce the number of times that care experienced young people are moved throughout their childhood? Minister. Tackling inequality is absolutely at the heart of this government's agenda and as part of this we are committed to improving all aspects of the lives of looked after children so that they can reach their full potential during education and beyond. As the member highlighted, the proportion of looked after school leavers with one or more qualification of SQ, SCQF level 5 or better has continued to increase, more than doubling from 15% to 44% since 2009-10. There are a myriad different circumstances why multiple placements occur. And as you say, the um, relationship between the number of placements and adverse outcomes for young people are, um, is very well established. So through the Permanence and Care Excellence Programme, the PACE Programme, we are beginning to see a reduction in drift and delay in the system as more children achieve permanence. And as you say, that it is, of course, the looked after um, the independent care review now in its journey phase, which I'm absolutely sure will be looking at the impact of the journey between placements. And I look forward to welcoming the findings of the review. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. Given the announcements made yesterday and acknowledging that looked after young people are disproportionately more likely to become homeless, I'd like to ask what actions are you taking to ensure that young care leavers are ready for independent life and you can reduce their chances of becoming homeless? Minister. As you know, uh, we have a number of um, measures in place to support the implementation of continuing care. We've paid 4.2 million annually to local authorities since 2015-16 to the implementation of continuing care, which will rise to 9.3 million by 2019-20. And in addition, we're working with local authorities via staff, um, continuing care focus group to gather information on the use of continuing care and to help resolve any issues. We are working very hard in this area. I'm more than happy to meet with the member, along with my colleague, the Minister for um, housing, who's done a great deal of work in preventing homelessness, to fully appraise you of all the measures that we are taking to work on this very, very challenging area. Question five is not lodged. Question six, Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that Highlands Lands Airport Limited's decision not to consult regarding car parking charges at some island airports is consistent with the provisions of the Islands Scotland Bill. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Um, Highlands, Islands Enterprise, uh, Highlands Islands Airport Limited has consulted on the implementation of the extension of car parking charges to Stornoway, Kirkwall and Sunbury airports. Highlands has taken account of the responses to its consultation work and has made changes to its uh, implementation of the charges as a result. This includes making free parking available at Sunbury Airport for the use of inter-island travellers, extending the free drop-off and pick-up period from one hour to two hours, and allowing blue badge holders to park for free. I'm also aware of specific measures that HIAL will be taking forward to offer free parking for those travelling by air for NHS appointments and those who are travelling under Logan Air's compassionate travel policy, and I particularly welcome those steps. 
Tavish Scott. Thank you. Can I welcome the Minister uh, to his new position as re with responsibility for the islands and forgive him for not answering the question. Um, the, uh, uh, can he, will he accept and bring maybe an open mind to this particular issue that there has not been any proper consultation on this uh, matter and nor has there been, as the councils and community councils have asked for, a full impact assessment? Uh, will he bring his uh, considerable abilities to tackle this problem and insist those two things happen? Minister. Well, I, I certainly uh, thank uh, Tavish Scott for his kind remarks, and I certainly hear what Mr Scott is saying. I'm keen to listen to stakeholders in the islands, and I'm, I'm happy to meet uh, Tavish Scott at any time on any matter to do with uh, the implementation of the island bill, because I'm keen to work with him and other island members on, in that. Uh, I do make the point, though, that I think there are some important changes that have been made by High Isle. I hope uh, Mr Scott welcomes those, but I'm, I'm keen to hear from him if there's anything further that can be done. Jamie Halker Johnson. Uh, thank you. Welcome to the Minister to his uh, position. Um, the move by High Isle to introduce parking charges was at least financially motivated, uh, and today we've seen Logan Air, the main operator of the islands, uh, announce significant losses. Both organisations will be looking for certainty about the government's future approach to island aviation and RET on ferry fares, which will undoubtedly have an impact on their businesses. So, with that in mind, can the Minister give any clarity on when the pledge to introduce RET on the Northern Isles route will be delivered? Minister. Uh, that is a matter that is obviously something that will be high in the agenda for both the Cabinet, cabinet Secretary designate, Mr Matheson, and myself to, to discuss. Again, happy to meet with uh, Mr Halco Johnson to talk about uh, such matters uh, and the importance of them to the island economy. I'm aware, it's early in my portfolio, but I'm aware how important the RET issue is to the, to the island's economies and indeed keen to discuss that with all members. Question number seven, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to re reduce the death rate from drug abuse in Ayrshire in light of reports that this has more than trebled since 2010. A range of measures have been taken forward by Alcohol and Drug Partnership in Air Partnerships in Ayrshire. A pan Ayrshire drug death prevention framework was published in May. This followed on from an Ayrshire wide drug death conference in November 2017. Work to reduce deaths in the, is being supported by local death prevention groups as well as the Pan Ayrshire Drug Death Prevention Group. Nationally, the Scottish Government has invested over £746 million to tackle uh, problem drug and alcohol use since 2008. Additionally, additionally, we will allocate a further £20 million a year to support the improvement of treatment services. We will also publish a substance use strategy later this summer which is being developed in recognition of the changing drug landscape in Scotland, not least the complex health needs of people with problematic drug use. Thank you, um, Mr Fitzpatrick, for his answer. And he will have been as disappointed as I was to learn that drug-related death, crude mortality rates by NHS Board of Residents 2009 to 2016 show that Ayrshire is the highest rate in Scotland at 23 per 100,000 of population. And I welcome what he has just said, but given this level of increase in drug-related deaths is happening right across Scotland, would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the previous method of dealing with this growing population problem has not worked, and would he further agree that it's time for the Scottish Government to take a new approach to addressing this problem which blights Ayrshire and Scotland? Minister. I, I, thank, I thank the member for the very rapid promotion, <laughs> which I'm sure was not deliberate. Um, uh, I, I do recognise this, this is a very serious issue and it's not something that we, we um, can, can take lightly. lightly. That, that is why that we are we're looking to develop a new strategy and I absolutely will work with any members who have um, suggestions on how we can take this forward. I've all, already met with two members on this particular issue today. I'd be keen to meet with the member if he has some particular um, ideas. Um, I know that from his local area in South, South Ayrshire, we have expert advice from Kenny Leister, who's Head of Community and Healthcare. Um, and, and, and he's, he's one of the experts that we're working in terms, in terms of trying to develop um, a strategy going forward to, to, to look at how we address that changing landscape of um, drug use. But clearly, if the member or any other members across the chamber have suggestions on, on how that strategy should be developed, my door is absolutely open. Thank you very much. That concludes general questions.